good, everybody. You made it so far. We're near the end. Dr. Woods will be up here soon. But right now, one of the things I do, I work part-time for the 10th Amendment Center. Again, my name's John Michaels. I'm the events director. Michael Bolden, myself, a number of other people have helped set this event up. Glad to see you've all made it out here to attend. My other job, ironically, is I'm a touring sound engineer for a rock band. A national rock band, so we play all over the U.S. So, if I want to go to work, it involves getting on a plane every time. I take microphones, I take cables, I take recording devices. I stand up for my rights. They don't like that. Our next speaker is brought to us by WeWon'tFly.com. He's going to tell us a little bit about the uh, Transportation Security Administration. <laughs> I share your sentiments. Please welcome James Papp. Wow. It's great to be with you guys today. I'd like to thank the 10th Amendment Center and all the organizers of Nullify Now, and I'd like to thank all of the interesting speakers and all of you in the audience for being here. This really is a great opportunity. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm going to start with a brief overview of my involvement in the TSA resistance movement, and I'm going to highlight prospects for state and county level nullification. Many of today's speakers have explained the role of state and county level opposition to federal tyranny. I'd like to extend the nullification concept to also include personal nullification, where individuals can take immediate action without having to rely on politicians. We Won't Fly is a grassroots ad advocacy group for dignified air travel. In 2010, I founded We Won't Fly with fellow libertarian activist George Donnelly. Our motto is act now, travel with dignity. We're just regular dads who don't want our families to be put at risk by the TSA's bogus security theater. Uh, we're working for the total abolishment of the TSA. We don't advocate TSA reform. We don't want to tweak it. We don't want to ask for better training or employee screening. We're not even really concerned about the exact amount of radiation that's unhealthy during a virtual strip search. We don't think there's a right way to, to search a child uh, with blue gloves. Uh, we're calling for the total elimination and the full restoration of the traveler rights to dignity and privacy. Well, We Won't Fly started as a local libertarian outreach operation. Uh, this one was a little bit different from our usual activities because it blew up, first it blew up on the internet and then the old media caught it and it blew up on the old media. Uh, since our founding in 2010, we've done hundreds of interviews on major TV and radio channels, numerous major papers like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post. We even got to write a guest editorial in USA Today. International media has been all over this too. Uh, we've done interviews across Canada, Europe, even China, Iran, Brazil. Uh, it's, I mean, for media-starved libertarians, this has been an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's been a great opportunity to educate the public and to offer our solutions to a worldwide audience. Now, not everybody wants to completely abolish the TSA, but all but the most obedient state worshipers agree that the TSA is totally out of control. Uh, I think the media actually appreciates our frank illumination of what the TSA is doing, and their audiences, for the most part, agree with our positions. Speaking of obedient state worshipers, uh, a particular highlight for me was when Whoopi Goldberg called us out on The View. Those dumb biddies said that George and I should be on a terrorist watch list for suggesting that people opt out of the radiation. Uh, and she said, for organizing mass demonstrations against the scanners, uh, this act was labeled an act of terrorism. Uh, in this very same segment now, though, they tried to ridicule Ron Paul for also supporting our TSA boycott. So it really feels good to be in that kind of company. 
Uh, I can only imagine that this is the type of joy that Michael Bolden or Tom Woods feels uh, when they're attacked by shills like Rachel Maddow or those phonies at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Uh, later I got wind of an administrative directive from the Department of Homeland Security declaring us domestic extremists. I didn't even know what a domestic extremist was. I'm picturing people like frantically vacuuming and dusting. Like. So anyway, this did make me a little bit nervous, but I knew we were hitting, hitting the mark. Uh, there's a good Winston Churchill quote that's going around Facebook. He says, uh, you have enemies? Good. That means you, you've stood up for something in your lives. Um, I think that's, you know, I think that's a great quote. Um, I was recently surprised to find out that I was on the list for the Southern Poverty Law Center. <laughs> but great, great. Unfortunately, it was just their fundraising list. Oh. Yeah. So I'm hoping that my, my being here today is going to increase my status there. Um, now, I'm sure I don't have to tell most of you what's going on in the airports. Some of you might have experienced the scope and growth operation on your way here. Uh, for the rest of you, let's briefly review what's going on. Uh, the TSA has been installing scanners in hundreds of terminals across the country. In case you're not aware of the level of invasiveness, you should know that the radiation is being used to take high-resolution nude photographs of travelers. These scans are so detailed that they can tell if a man is circumcised or not or if a woman is menstruating. These things can see every body part in detail but can easily miss certain types of explosives or metal objects if placed on your side. <laughs> Government voyeurs in a back room ogle at these nude images of men, women, and children. Millions of travelers have been searched in this manner without consent, without search warrants, and without probable cause. Now, they do reluctantly give us the option to opt out of the radiation strip search. Instead, we can choose to have what, the, uh, what they euphemistically call an enhanced pat-down. But under the FBI definition, this is actually sexual assault. They put their hand between your legs and go all the way up, sometimes quite forcefully. They put their hands on breasts, between buttocks, and actually reach into the pants of men, women, and even children. The TSA admitted that this pat-down is used as a punitive measure against people that opt out of the scan. You may have seen the video where they actually reach into a baby's diaper, or the recent one where a three-year-old in a wheelchair is terrified as he endures a probing blue-gloved assault. This helpless child instinctively knows that what's happening is wrong. He calls out for his dad to help. The dad is forbidden from even holding the child's hand during this. All he can say is, it's no big deal. Well, I think this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. And this is not the lesson I want to teach our children. Again, we have... Again, we have no consent, no warrants, no probable cause, zero terrorists caught with, this, with these techniques. We get terrified children, humiliated travelers, and phony security theater. So, what has really made We Won't Fly a success are the first-hand stories that we share. And just to hammer home the severity of the problems we're facing in the airport, I'd like to share with you just a few quotes from travelers. Mary in Texas reported, the TSA agent used her hands to feel under and between my breasts. She then rammed her hand up into my crotch until it jammed into my pubic bone. I was touched in the pubic region in between my labia. She then moved her hand across my pubic region and down the inner part of my upper thigh of the floor. She repeated this procedure on the other side. I was shocked and broke into tears. Alan from Nebraska. I was visibly upset when he started to fondle me inappropriately. I yelled, I want to see your supervisor. I asked emphatically if he was allowed to grab my genitals and the supervisor said he was. After fondling my genitals, he groped my buttocks and told me to have a good flight. <laughs> Rosemary in Virginia, the entire fair was very punitive and humiliating and time consuming and emotionally distressing. When I retrieved my things, I walked into the woman's restroom and wept. 
Scott in New Mexico. While in the private room, the agent inappropriately touched my genitalia more than once and made me feel incredibly uncomfortable. The agent also pulled down my shorts about halfway and I had to ask the agent to let me pull them back up. I was inappropriately touched, groped, rubbed, massaged, and sexually harassed. The procedure was violating, degrading, invasive, and humiliating. There are thousands of stories just like these. TSA officials have even suggested that parents make a game out of the TSA assault for their children. They're conditioning an entire generation to just submit to any abuse that they dream up. Advice columnist Amy Alkin published a following, the following personal account of her assault by TSA agent Fadala McGee. She wrote, nearing the end of this violation, I sobbed even louder as the woman four times <laughs> stuck the side of her gloved hand into my vagina through my pants between my labia. She really got up there four times right back and left and front right and left in my vagina between my labia. I was shocked, utterly unprepared for how she got the side of her hand up there. It was government sanctioned sexual assault. I mean, as upon leaving, still sobbing, I yelled at the woman, you raped me. Yes. I mean, can you imagine this happening to, to someone in your family? I, I'm just horrified by this. <laughs> now, in return for being gate raped, the TSA did respond, but it wasn't with an apology. Ms. Alkin was threatened with a $500,000 defamation suit if she didn't immediately take down her blog post. So unencumbered by moral principles or the Bill of Rights, the TSA is one of the most egregious examples of unchecked federal power. So let's see how they stack up against the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the right of the people to assemble. Well, if you can't travel, you can't assemble. Second Amendment, yeah, good luck defending your right of self-defense on a plane or in, a, or in an airport. And, and we know that if this right had been respected, 9-11 would have been a much different occurrence. Uh, the Fourth Amendment, protection from unreasonable search and seizure. They, they just pretend this doesn't even exist. Fifth Amendment, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process. Well, tell that to these thugs that are stealing shampoo and nail clippers and groping our grandmas. Ninth Amendment, protection of rights not specifically enumerated in the Constitution. Without a doubt, the right to travel with dignity is retained by the people. Tenth Amendment, obviously there is no delegated power to nationalize airline security. I might even consider the occupation of the airports and the forced extraction of TSA salaries as the quartering of troops. So let's add the Third Amendment in there. So here's one agency that's violating most of the Bill of Rights they're restricting our travel, peeking under our clothes, grabbing our junk, and ripping us off. I'd say we have a pretty good case for nullification. The federal courts are of no use at all as a remedy. Jesse Ventura tried to sue the TSA on constitutional grounds, and it was thrown out by a federal judge. They are not going to let a jury anywhere near this issue. And the federal courts rarely intervene, especially when it comes to matters of national security. So the, now the U.S. Congress, of course, they're a joke on this issue. Lots of politicians like to talk tough about this agency that they actually helped create, but no one has made a, meal, um, has made a move to repeal it. John Micah from Florida is the worst. He actually wrote the legislation and sponsored it that created the TSA. Now he likes to go on TV and talk tough about the TSA. He's called what they're doing a big kabuki dance. But he hasn't sponsored any repeal bills. He should be sponsoring repeal, and he should be personally apologizing to every single air traveler. Former Congressman Bob Barr voted to create the TSA, but now he's trying to capitalize on anti-TSA sentiment with a new organization, but still no apologies. The only active bill I'm aware of in Congress merely aims to strip the TSA employees of their job title officer, as if we're really concerned about the job title of a child molester. I mean, that's all we have.
Ron Paul has had a bill that would strip immunity from TSA employees. They don't actually have immunity to commit sexual assault, though. So we've got rampant constitutional violations, useless federal courts, a bought and paid for Congress, and an executive branch that's totally out of control. So, I mean, asking the federal government to limit itself is the very definition of insanity. At the state level, a few nullification efforts have sprouted. In Texas, courageous state rep David Simpson led an effort in the Texas legislature to ban the TSA scope and grow. And he had sweeping success, including a unanimous vote in the Texas House. The Texas Senate was almost uh, completely on board as well. And through pressure, even the governor was reluctantly cooperating. Uh, at the last minute, the, the feds came in and they threatened to ground the flights in Texas if they, didn't, if they went through with this. So a lot of people were pressured. We could only imagine the sticks and the carrots that came out for this. But in the end, they were able to, to kill it in the Texas Senate. Uh, when Texas reconvenes its biennial legislative session in January, Simpson's going to reintroduce this. And I wish him the best of luck both for Texas and every TSA victim. Other states have, been, have made far less progress. And in fact, most state efforts have been nothing more than non-binding resolutions. I'm personally opposed to these non-binding resolutions. Uh, they might seem like a small step forward. They can generate a little bit of media attention. But spineless politicians love an opportunity to sound tough on something and then quietly continue serving the status quo. And to me, that's what these non-binding resolutions do. Uh, even if we had a principled nullification bill and it failed, these punks still have to go on record, yes or no. Do you support child molestation in the airport? The, the, the non-binding resolution bills do not accomplish this. In fact, these, these resolution bills usually sound something like this. Dear great and powerful federal masters, if it does not offend you, would you possibly consider changing slightly the way in which you are violating our rights? Pretty please? If not, if not, that's okay, sorry to bother you. This is not exactly the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. And, and let's face it, state level politicians aren't much better than their federal counterparts. For the state reps with guts, the 10th Amendment Center has created model, some model legislation called the Traveler Freedom Act. You can check it out on their website. Here in Pennsylvania, last year we had House Bill 852 introduced by Representative Will Tallman. And this was a pretty good bill. Uh, it makes contact with another person's genitals or breasts in the course of a body search a third degree misdemeanor, and it specifically denies immunity to government employees in most settings. Sadly, HB 852 was opposed by the ACLU. They acknowledge the extreme invasiveness and gross violations of human rights caused by the TSA, but they actually said that the bill inserts the state government into an area of law covered by the federal government, presenting constitutional problems under the Supremacy Clause. Now, you think all of those lawyers at the ACLU, somebody, you know, maybe somebody read Tom Wood's book, I don't know, but um, they might actually understand that the Supremacy Clause makes protections under the U.S. Constitution supreme, not the unlimited whims of an emperor. So as you can see, the Tenth Amendment Center has some work to do. At best, the ACLU is schizophrenic on nullification. Uh, in this case, I think, you know, they think civil liberties are great unless the federal government takes them away, in which case just tough luck. You must bow to the supreme leader. Uh, H HB 852 was referred to the state government committee and never seen again. Needless to say, around here, things haven't been the same since we lost Ben Franklin. <laughs> I'm really glad that Sheriff Mack is here today because I think county level efforts to oppose federal tyranny are a lot more interesting. I would be thrilled to see just one gutsy sheriff with the support of his community and an airport in his county uh, arrest for child pornography and sexual assault can begin at any time. Unfortunately, I've only heard of a few anecdotal stories of progress in this area, but sheriff-level resistance of other federal agencies is growing thanks to people like Sheriff Mack. 
So if the federal, state, and local governments continue to fail us, what nullification efforts do we have left? As a libertarian anarchist, I have no use for politicians, as you might guess. Pitting them against each other is kind of fun, but I'm looking for a strategy that just leaves politics out of the equation. And so I'd like to suggest sort of the next step for nullification is personal nullification. Personal nullification doesn't require a single politician. Election, legislation, or majority opinion, and it cannot be uh, stopped by federal bribes or threats. This is the core strategy of We Won't Fly. Our solution is to just stop complying with the TSA. Don't go near a TSA-infested airport. Never consent to a search. Stand your ground. Frederick Douglass explained our situation to a T when he said, find out just what any people will quietly submit to, and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue until they are resisted with either words or blows or both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. The TSA has only the power that we give them. They've been pushing and probing our endurance for some time, and they have correctly concluded that they have no limits. Our job is to correct that. And this is so much bigger than the airports. The TSA has a thing called Viper Teams, and these are slithering into our highways, train stations, sporting events. Uh, TSA has even been used to do security at school proms. If we don't turn things around soon, Future, genera future generations won't even remember the time when a warrantless search was forbidden. The people are being conditioned to reflexive obedience to anyone with a badge. We must resuscitate this freedom to be secure in our persons. The key to that, I believe, is personal nullification, civil disobedience, and a resolute refusal to cooperate with anyone We can't cooperate with anyone that's going to test the boundaries of our tolerance for injustice. This is the essence of the We Won't Fly strategy. While others have focused on political solutions, new legislation, and lobbying efforts, the tactic advocated by We Won't Fly is surprisingly enough to not fly. Um, avoid the airports. Avoid, uh, you know, opt out of everything the TSA does. Protect yourself, protect your family from the radiation and potential sexual assault. This strategy was first suggested to me by Michael Roberts, who is a courageous pilot who walked off the job rather than submit himself to a humiliating uh, search or scan. The idea is to show the industry that we won't buy their services if it means we're going to be abused. By targeting the travel industry's profits, we've hoped to win their lobbying power. Now, I don't expect politicians to listen to me, but sometimes they do listen to big money. All the time. <laughs> Sometimes it's big enough. So, so is our strategy working? Um, our Facebook page has endless comments from folks who are choosing not to fly. We get loads of comments like these. Lydia says, I still have people rolling their eyes when I say I refuse to fly commercial. Let them roll their eyes. I'm not getting on a commercial flight unless I'm unconscious or dead when they put me on it. Tim Miley writes, I just got from, back from a vacation in New York City, driving from my home in Detroit. The airlines can suck it. <laughs> the, uh, someone named Ker Kerwin posted, I don't fly anymore. I took Amtrak on my trip to Chicago last week. Wasn't pressed for time, so I enjoyed it. I didn't get a TSA prostate exam either. <laughs> With 20,000 Facebook fans, I see these posts every day. And evidently, there's more than just anecdotal evidence that we're having an impact. The, the U.S. Travel Association estimates that the travel industry is losing $85 billion per year due to the TSA's abuse of security theater. Is that significant? I think it is, but the airlines are still thrilled to offload their security costs and liability onto the backs of tax workers. <coughs> They're not about to stand up and demand responsibility for their passenger safety. They're not about to demand the abolishment of the TSA. Hotels and other related industries 
might be more supportive of our effort. But even though the TSA isn't about to suddenly vanish, I think this is still worth celebrating. This $85 billion figure represents an emerging market for commercial air travel alternatives and entrepreneurial <laughs> workarounds. We don't need to wait for politicians to make air travel a dignified experience again. As more and more people refuse to be abused, the incentives are increasing for alternatives. This is how personal nullification will succeed. Email, faxes, and FedEx have nullified the post office monopoly. The market for alternatives to traditional air travel are just emerging. Look for the emergence of uh, travel agents that specialize in arranging scan and rope free air travel options using general aviation flights, cooperative plane sharing, and routing through TSA free airports. We're already seeing small airlines advertising a TSA free experience. Interactive online conferences and conventions can replace many traditional events that rely heavily on air travel. That $85 billion is on the table right now, and it's the prize for the agorists that are willing to build the solutions that we need. As that figure grows, so will our options. The TSA uses centralized aggression and coercion. The resistance is decentralized, and we cooperate voluntarily. We can leverage that strength to regain our freedom to travel. If the public, if the politicians and the courts ever catch up with the, with the public's need to fly with dignity, well, that's great. But I don't see them as the answer. They'll probably show up later and act like they solved the problem for us. But so be it. We can support our local and state nullification efforts, but our real work is restoring the concept of self-ownership. If people are willing to be scanned and groped and commanded and abused, there's always going to be somebody willing to do that abuse. Compliance is the problem. Resistance and defiance is the only solution. Now we can abolish the TSA, but it won't have any effect if we can't restore dignity and individualism as cultural values. I believe that for many, these values are dormant, but can be reawakened. Courage is contagious. Every demonstration of defiance inspires others. Every demonstration, uh, I mean, we can spend our time, we can be begging these politicians for help, or we can build a future that doesn't need them. Let's continue to build the ranks of travelers willing to stand up and defend their rights. Let's be ready to support the bold innovators who are creating the alternatives that we need. It's time to heed the warning of Frederick Douglass and prescribe some limits for these tyrants. Thank you very much. Thanks again, and thank you, Michael. Great, great show today. Thanks. Pay $100 and they won't grow you. All right, so the, uh, the super awesomeness of Tom Woods is coming on.